Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the chief executive here, also a proud member. This week, the CEO and chairman of the largest investment company in the world wrote an open letter to corporate CEOs. BlackRock CEO, Lawrence D. Fink, does this every year, but this year was a little bit different. After noting that the stock market and those invested in it had enjoyed an extraordinary run in 2017, he then said, said, basically, that's not enough. I'll quote a passage. Quote, society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities in which they operate. Now, this may sound somewhat revolutionary, putting other stakeholders on par with shareholders, but in some ways, BlackRock may simply be catching up with the leaders who are on our panel today. Our conversation today is simply about this. How can organizations, public and private companies, private equity investors, even public sector entities, thrive and deliver returns by putting values at the center of their work? At first blush, this sort of idealism might seem to fly in the face of the capitalist project of, de of delivering a return to shareholders. And in the public sector, we find ourselves frequently grappling with the question of whose needs should be given top priority. This is all the terrain of our conversation, so let me introduce our panelists. We'll start with the man who traveled farthest. <laughs> Percy Falwell is the mayor of Gander, Newfoundland, a Canadian town on the eastern side of the easternmost island in Canada that has a time zone all of its own. It is a town of about 11,000 people and one big airport. And on 9-11, when planes were diverted from U.S. airspace, 38 planes landed in Gander, bringing 6,700 passengers who had been bound for the U.S. And the story of what happened there that week is a lesson in kindness. Next to Mayor Falwell is Dina Dwyer. She's co-chairwoman of the Dwyer Group. Dina Dwyer Owens, pardon me. The, the co-chairwoman -chair, of the Dwyer Group. They're a franchise organization holding group based in Waco, Texas and they are driven by core values that they put at the heart of all that they do. Dean is also the author of two books, including Values Incorporated, copies of which she has made available to all of you today, which you can pick up on your way out. Thank you very much for that, Dina. And lastly, we have our local hero, Stuart Cole. He's been in private equity since 1988. He's been with Riverside since 1993, where he's the co-CEO. The company has some $6 billion under management, invested in more than 80 companies. One of those companies is the Dwyer Group, full disclosure. Okay. Um, Stewart is well known in Cleveland for his civic leadership, perhaps most visibly on the board of the Cleveland Clinic, where he helped to start Velosano, the charity bike ride dedicated to eradicating cancer. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Uh, so um, as we start, too, I want to thank Values in Action for, um, for kind of bringing all of this together. There's an event tonight to honor the, the three of you and others. And, um, and so, Stuart, thank you very much for your leadership there. Um, I want to start uh, by asking each of you for kind of your, your values in action story, if you will. Um, and Mayor, Mayor Falwell, and, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to begin, please. Uh, certainly. I, well, ours, ours is very, very much a, a spontaneous uh, story. It's not a, a, the... Uh, the events that occurred in uh, September 11, 2001 are well known to everybody in this room and around, around the world. And in a little small community that you just uh, described in, in uh, the middle of uh, uh, Newfoundland, uh, an island stuck out in the North Atlantic, you might wonder how, how we might become engaged and 16 years later still, be, uh, still feel like we're very much engaged in that story. 
the, uh, as you described, I mean, what occurred in, that, in our community on that day when American airspace, or when all of North American airspace was closed, because we are sitting on, a, uh, on the Great Circle routes between, uh, between North America and Europe, m uh, pretty well all uh, air traffic that, that uh, transits between uh, North America and Europe pass over our heads every day, and our air traffic control center controls all that traffic. So when airspace was closed in North America, aircraft had to get on the ground quickly, and many of them were, re were rerouted to, uh, to our community. To the extent, and we didn't know how long they were there for, we didn't know who was on those aircraft, uh, and so on. But uh, that, none of that mattered. Uh, when, you know, we ended up with 38 uh, aircraft with uh, 67, 6,800 people who, it turns out, needed to stay with us for four or five days. Uh, we're a community at the time of about 10,000 people. So... <laughs> Everybody gets a buddy. <laughs> Talk about a few people coming over for a wedding. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, the, the town has an emergency plan in place for coordination in, in exceptional circumstances and so on. Uh, those, the, those things that we contemplate when we develop those plans don't usually involve 6,800 uh, live bodies showing up unannounced. But uh, we're a pretty hospitable people. And uh, the, the story, our story, I guess, is that in spite of you know, the planning that was in place and so on, what came through was the generosity of our people because it takes a lot of people to take care of 67, 6,800 people who don't even have the benefit of their luggage that, which is left on the aircraft. And people from 100 different countries and every religion you could imagine and every racial origin you could imagine and every language you could imagine. So uh, the people of our, our town and surrounding area, there's a lot of smaller communities around us, uh, managed to pull that off, and we like to think that we, we we've said. I mean, there's been a Broadway musical now written about this, and uh, and when the, when they came and uh, he's not kidding. When they I'm not kidding, <laughs> very successful Broadway musical, yeah. and uh, when the uh, writers came to research that, came to visit us uh, a number of years ago to research that, some of our locals were known to say to them, "Really, you're going to write a musical about a bunch of people making sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that." And, you know, from what I hear, it's yeah. probably going to surpass a Hamilton in revenue. A few Tonys so, later, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, they were on to something that we didn't, we just recognized as something that we, you would do for anybody. But, uh, so, you know, I guess it was because of the context, uh, the scale, and, uh, and the fact that, at, you know, at the worst of times, some, you know, in the, in, when, when some of the worst of humanity was on display, uh, there was a little shining light of some of the best of humanity. So I guess that's our story. And, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's it's not about me. I was the deputy mayor there at the time, of course, or not of course, but I was the deputy mayor there at the time. <laughs> and uh, but it's about the people. It's about all the people that their own individual value systems uh, summoned them to come and help out. And that's that's really what our story is. Um, the the musical for those of you who don't know is called Come From Away, and it's called Come From Away because. Um, because people who aren't from Gander would be referred to as somebody who has come from away. When people visit our province, they're known as come from aways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and come from away, we'll be playing in Cleveland this that's summer. Right, that's right, that's wow. yeah. right. Yeah, next year. Um, Dina Dwyer Owens, um, your values in action story briefly, if you would, to yes, kind of so give the, people a context. For sure. It. Dwyer Group is a values-guided world leader of franchise business that focus on repairing, maintaining, and enhancing your homes and businesses. So to net that out, we're really in the business of helping people <laughs> have a better quality of life. We happen to use franchising as a vehicle to do that. And our founder, who happened to be my father, founded the company based on a, a core set of values. And uh, he took the company public in 93, died of a sudden heart attack in 94. And as a leadership team, our biggest fear was, is how do we keep this, this culture special at Dwyer Group without having this driven entrepreneur who was all about values, no longer with us. So we took his original core values and we operationalized them. They're under the theme of living rich, and that uh, stands for respect. So the R is respect, the I is integrity, the C is customer focus, and the H is one of my favorites. Having fun in the process is how you might <laughs> say it in Canada. So we believe when you live rich, um, treat people with respect and dignity, Great things happen, and because we are a for-profit organization, we believe that profit's really the applause that we get when we take great care of people. And we are blessed to uh, be partnered with the Riverside Company for a second time. Um, we were the first public-to-private deal that they did back in 2003. We were the first company that they reacquired. And I like to think that a big part of the reason they reacquired us was because they really appreciate that we are a values-guided leader. We are not a perfect company. We're far from perfect. I'm imperfect, which means everybody mm -hmm. on our team is probably imperfect too. And 
Uh, the goal is, is to keep our values front and center every day, and we've created a system. We're a franchise company, and what franchise companies do is we take what's most important in business, we create systems around what's most important so that they can be replicated. So the one thing that we do that most companies unfortunately haven't figured out, so I'm here to share it with anybody who wants to learn it, is create systems around those values so that day in and day out they're a way of thinking. They become part of your DNA. So anytime there's a meeting of three or more of our employees or franchisees, we actually take the time to focus on our values. Sometimes reviewing all 15 because we have very specific behaviors that are attached to each one of those core values. Um, or we might just focus on a, a value we need to get better at. As we kicked off the new year, one of the things that we did at a meeting recently is, what's the one value um, each of our leaders needs to get better at? And, and then we own that, and we work at getting better at that throughout the year. That was all like feedback you gave each other, or you no, just No, you have to own said, it. You have to admit yourself, and everybody said, around the table is going, yeah, you do need to work yeah, on that. Said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a meeting to talk to you about disrespect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stuart, I... Uh, so first of all, is, uh, is that true what Dina said? Is that why you acquired the company twice, you and your colleagues? Yeah, 100% true. And, uh, and it's so true uh, that after we met Dina and uh, visited Waco where they're headquartered and experienced um, how they use their code of values um, to uh, drive better uh, results, uh, we said um, we should do that too and formalized our we don't, I, I'd like to believe we always operated under principles, but um, we, we, become, we codified them and became much more rigorous in our use of them. Give me an example. I would like to hear sort of from both of you about kind of what that looks like in practice. Oh. Go ahead, I can go first. So yeah. when we think about the area of respect, you know, a lot of people might define respect differently than, than I would. So that's the reason why we have these core standards um, or values below each one of those areas. So one is listening with the intent to understand what is being said and acknowledging that what is said is important to the speaker. It's a lot of words, but it's really important. So it's about listening with the intent to really appreciate what somebody else is saying, not listening with the intent to reply, which sometimes I'm guilty of. <laughs> so in the case of working with uh, Stuart and the Riverside team is we have to have enough respect for one another as partners that we truly are going to listen. Um, to hear what the other party's saying. And one thing I can tell you about Stuart Cole is I always know that I'm being heard. So he practices that value. Whether he had it written down before or not, uh, it doesn't matter because he just lived it from the very moment we met him. But that would be one example of mm -hmm. how you put it into action. So we encourage our team members and our franchisees to learn the code of values by heart, with heart, which is really memorize the values but internalize the values so that when it comes to making a difficult decision in our business, the value should come top of mind, right? And those are the things we look to to make those tough decisions. And this gets all the way down to the plumber who works for the franchise that you operate, that you hold right. in your portfolio, who is actually listening to the homeowner saying, I really don't think you should put a hole in my wall right there. Exactly. But that's the easiest place to put it. No, no. That's yeah, right. right. That's right. S Stuart, what about with you and your colleagues? Yeah, so um, what I find so interesting about this uh, is uh, my, the Riverside Company is a private equity firm, and of course, as, as uh, Dina has described, the Dwyer Group is a leading uh, franchisor. And, and I don't agree with the latter characterization at all, but if you, because I think franchise businesses, um, uh, it's amazing what they do in terms of changing people's lives, uh, the hiring veterans, and the, and the great work the industry is doing. But there, there are other examples uh, that are not as shining. So if you, if you just said, there, you know, what are two industries maybe not known for uh, their values, uh, certainly private equity would be on the list. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and, uh, and then the other would be uh, perhaps another one might be franchising. Uh, so I feel like we're, uh, we're both in industries where you might say, well, you, you've got to adopt what others do. You've got to uh, race to the bottom, uh, devalue uh, your behavior in the industry in order to have good results. And, uh, Dwyer, by any metric, uh, financial or otherwise, outperforms its industry uh, wildly. Uh, Dina personally outperforms her industry, chair of the International Franchise Association, a uh, recognized leader in that industry, uh, precisely because they lead with values. Uh, the story of the Riverside Company, very quickly, is, um, is it's, uh, 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 my co-CEO is a gentleman named Bela Sigethy, and we are each uh, graduates of Oberlin College, and I'm very honored to, uh, to have President Ambar of Oberlin College with us today. Um, and uh, we have a, a number of other OBs who, who work at, at the Riverside Company. And I'm not 
saying we're, we're valued because we went to Oberlin, but maybe there's uh, some <laughs> partial uh, correlation uh, there as well. When Bill and I joined forces uh, in 1993, again, we hadn't formalized all of our values, but we agreed on two simple rules. We'll, uh, we'll follow the golden rule, uh, uh, do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you, and um, we'll leave great references in our wake. Those are the two simple rules that we had. And we said... Um, Is that how you articulated it at the time? Literally. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Literally. And um, that's, uh, I, I, I believe, how we have behaved, uh, not so much me, but many colleagues who are here today and 250 others around the world. When Bale and I adopted those simple principles, uh, we talked about the fact that we'd witnessed a lot of bad behavior in private equity. And I can give you uh, examples of, of that. Um, uh, we'd also witnessed some excellent behavior, but we were concerned that, about that. And, and we, didn't, uh, we didn't feel it was necessary to behave that way to, to uh, make a living, to put food on, on, on your table. Uh, and we said, in, and, and even if uh, we make a little less money, um, at least we sleep well, and when we wake up in the morning, we feel good about the guy we see in the mirror shaving. So um, what's so interesting to me now, looking back oh, 25 years later, is um, that I would argue that actually um, we've done better financially. Our returns are enhanced by the fact that we have um, first adopted these two simple rules and ultimately uh, codify them and try to live them more a la, a la Dina and Dwyer. Um, I like that because that's how we, I think, would most of us would wish the world worked. So mm -hmm. it's really nice sometimes when the world wish, works the way you would wish it would. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think a lot about uh, why that might be and, and even the coincidence of the word valuation, which is at the heart of what we do. It's a word that's used almost every day at Riverside. Uh, the same, the root of that word being the same as values. Yeah, but you don't really think about it. I mean, when you when you talk to you know, whoever, who, other people in private equity, or or you go back to Milton Friedman in 1970. We were talking about this earlier. Who said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits, and it ends there. Um, and if a yeah. CEO wants to do something charitable, they can do it on their own time. Yeah. Um, have you run into that kind of the obstacles and, and you know, pushback in that form? So, so I'm, uh, I'm so glad you started by quoting Mr. Fink um, and, and BlackRock. They, they only have $6 trillion. I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, to put it in perspective, uh, the entire private equity industry is about, uh, about $2.5 trillion. So uh -huh. they, are, they, are, uh, they are a large, large uh, player. Uh, and, I, and I think it's going to lead to a very interesting discussion. I think w well before that letter, though, there's been a lot of uh, thought and discussion about uh, what is the role of business, how much should business be regulated, uh, how much should business self-regulate, and, and uh, did, did Milton Friedman get it all right? Um, some of you may be familiar with B corporations, which are really challenging uh, a lot of this. <clears throat> a lot of um, uh, uh, people are, are asking, uh, and courts, I think, are starting to ask whether uh, when, uh, when, share, when boards make a decision, do they, what, what are the consider appropriate considerations um, besides just narrow, the narrow definition of, of, um, of profit for the shareholders? But, but I guess what I'm arguing, based on my experience, would be it's very um, narrow or short term to argue that uh, we can behave in uh, less honorable ways and, and enhance our value. I mean, to me, that is, um, that, if it ever worked, query, it's not going to work in, in, in a world with um, communications being as open and free as they are, social media being as active as it is. Uh, uh, we can talk about millennials and, and the changes in, in, in their expectations. So, so to me, it's, um, it's logical that businesses are, uh, are, are following what Dina figured out decades ago. Mm -hmm. Mayor, Mayor Farwell, um, I wonder if you find it, I, I wonder how you see all of this, this sort of conversation about values um, from the public sector standpoint, and, and in particular from the Canadian public sector standpoint. We have this... Um, this uh, mythology about Canada that everybody's really nice all the time. And I don't know if that's entirely true. Um, 
But I apologize um, for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but I wonder, um, I wonder how you see all of this and how you see the kind of the fascination with the Gander story, right? This sort of like, we're going to make a musical about people making sandwiches. That, um, is it all that remarkable? And why does it matter so much today? I think, I mean, you know, the, the whole thing we're talking about really when we're talking about values here is, you know, human beings exhibiting care and kindness and compassion towards other people. Uh, that's what you know came to the surface in in Gander on 9/11. Mm -hmm. Just happened to be Gander. Everybody landed in, you know, or not everybody, but I mean, just happened to be uh, a focal point for the, for that sort of thing. The opportunity to for those values to come to the surface and be in, enacted, uh, you know, was presented to us, and we were extremely thankful for that and were, felt blessed because you things are going on in the world, disasters go on, you know, unfortunately uh, all too often. And you know you, you feel helpless because you want to help, and but it's over there, and the best you can do is write out a check, and maybe someone will do something good with it. We were presented with a real tangible opportunity to physically put arms around people and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that that those those I believe you know people we we're, that's not unique to Gander. We don't have any monopoly on that. Uh, I think people all over the world, regardless of where they where they're born, are born with that with some of these the capacity for that. I think uh, in the period, you know, after they're born, there are filters that get layered on them, and you know, in the, in the environments they live in, the the ideologies they grow up under, and so on, mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes it mutes that uh, what I think is a, is a basic instinct of human beings to help each other. It's, it's a basic instinct of all other animals. Why wouldn't it be the basic instinct of humans as well? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so to the extent that you know, the corporate community is uh, is sort of encouraging that and, and sort of peeling off some of those filters and those layers, <coughs> mm -hmm. I think it, it benefits, uh, benefits the world greatly because the more, and I, I love the fact there's a lot of young people here in this room mm -hmm. today, and the, the more people are inspired by stories, whether it's by the story of Gander in 9-11 in, in or are inspired by the, the values-based uh, you know, uh, organization they work for in the corporate community and so on, the better off the whole the whole world is. So, I mean, it's all you know. Like I say, you can break it down to its most fundamental. The most fundamental point here is people caring and uh, being kind to others and, and showing compassion and so on. And and, uh, and we've all got a part to play in that. Governments have a part to play in that. Sometimes they don't do it very well. <laughs> uh, but uh, but we can only do what we can do. I wonder if you'd say more about the the role of government and the the role that government has to play in all of this and in sort of being a, a leader in kindness. And um, I could be really oblique and not say what I'm actually trying to say mm -hmm. here, but I'll, I'll try and just get to it. <laughs> um, there's a lot of heated rhetoric right now and a lot of people questioning the standing of the United States in the world um, when, you know, when we talk about America first, you know, whether or not that's, it wasn't obviously when, when the 38 planes landed in Gander, there, I mean, you as deputy mayor didn't say, wait, stop, gander first. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so uh, you stand in opposition to some forces um, that, uh, that are you know, at play in the world right now. We do, and, and uh, that's, you know, it's unfortunate, and it's not specific to any one, one government. Some are in, you know, uh, have more profile than others, I guess, but uh, no, it's, it's uh, you know, when, when situations like that occur, and uh, then, uh, you know, the uh, responses, I think those, those underlying responses come to the surface. The, the issue with uh, governments, we, you know, our municipal government, as you said, I mean, we, we, at that point, it wasn't like, well, hold on a second, if we give away all the underwear in Walmart, who's go, where are we going to get our underwear? <laughs> <laughs> It's not Which a became concern. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's an underlying concern. So, so uh, fortunately, you know, there was no, and there was no one that could stop us from giving away all the underwear in in, uh, in Walmart. So uh, you know, our, were people our, wondering? I mean, were people saying, "Who's going to pay the bills for this?" Right. That's always the question. Who's yeah. going to pay for this? No, that didn't happen. It was that was never a question. I mean, there are programs in place with our federal government for emer you know emergency measures and so on. That whereby. Mm -hmm. After the fact, if you keep some of the bills, you get some compensation for it, whether it was a flood or whatever it was. Right. right? So, you know, I guess that prospect was there and, and was utilized after the fact to a degree. But no, that question was never asked. It was never a question of who's going to pick up the bill. You know, like the, the, uh, the stores, there's, there's stories of, 
of people, uh, people who we had, fortunately we had really good weather when that was going on and uh, in September and uh, some of the people who were, you know, herded into rooms with a lot of, like a room like this probably would have had a hundred people sleeping in it. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, so some of these people, given the nice weather, said, well, let's go to Canadian Tire, a local, you know, store, uh, and see if we'll pick up some sleeping bags and maybe a tent and see if we'll sleep out on the lawn. It would be a nice experience. People did that, and when they showed up at the, the checkouts and pulled out the credit cards, were told, are you with the people here that are stranded on the aircraft? Oh, well, just take it. There's no charge, right? I mean, that, wow. that was actually happening. Mm -hmm. Those stores yeah. didn't necessarily know they were going to get compensated. I'd, I don't think they did. I don't think anybody ever did come back mm -hmm. after them for it. But so there's those sorts of things. People couldn't go for a walk. The, 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 the passengers that were stranded couldn't go for a walk because when they did, they were constantly having cars stop next to them, ask them if they wanted a ride. Yeah. So they, <laughs> so, <laughs> you couldn't. I, I remember my, my wife and I out on our front lawn one day watching some people walk, trying to walk down the sidewalk. <laughs> and, uh, and so a car pulls over, and I know what the conversation is like, you need to go somewhere? What do you need, right? I was like, no, no, no it's okay. We're just, you know, just out for a just walk. Exercise. Okay. <laughs> You know, a few paces later, another car stops, right? Right. <laughs> so I wonder if they didn't just give it up and go back on their, you know, mat in the gym somewhere and go to sleep. Because yeah. they couldn't get, couldn't get anywhere. Oh, I suppose that, and I think that's, I mean, that's a story that would resonate in almost any era. Mm. Um, but, um, Dina, I think that the, your books, um, this, uh, the, the way in, in which you're being honored tonight, uh, echoed as it is in, in this, the letter from the BlackRock CEO. I mean, what is it about this moment? where your story is so important, where Stuart's story is so important, where the mayor's story is so important. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think the story just proves that values do create value. You know, so the more we live our values, I think the more value is created. And I'm talking about profits. And yes, some of those companies Stuart was talking about earlier that maybe are very unethical, but are driven by the dollar, they might be making some good money, but how much more money could they be making if they implemented values? and really did things right. So what we're proving is that you can do things right and treat people with great respect and still have amazing profits. I must say, um, we've partnered with Riverside for the second time and our company has grown 100% in the last three and a half years. And we are more about values today than ever before because as we grow, we're 1.5 billion in system-wide sales. I take that very seriously and so does our CEO and our leadership team that People have told us that you can't keep this up. You know, the larger the company gets, the harder it's going to be to keep those values alive. And we're saying we have to keep them alive because otherwise we'll die. Um, so, and, and I just want to thank Stuart and what he's doing too. And you talked about government a second ago. We can complain about it all day long and, you know, how values aren't being practiced. And is that going to make it change? No. We've got to do something about it. And your organization, um, Susan, you guys are doing something about it. And that's the best thing that we can all do. So we're trying to do something about it at Dwyer. And I, I'm privileged to speak all over the globe about this message because people are hungry. They're hungry for this message about leading with values. And I'm blessed to have an amazing group of leaders at our company and, and employees across the globe and franchisees who strive to live our values. We're, we're, again, we're not mm -hmm. perfect. We're just really working hard to live up to that bar that we've set. Yeah. And that gives me the opportunity to go and speak about this in front of other audiences. And the fact that a 37-year-old company has grown 100%, in the last three and a half years, should say something to the world yeah. about the opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuart Cole, have there been moments where you have looked at a, a very profitable company and felt like it wasn't a good fit because, um, because there, there weren't values in place, because you, you sensed something underlying in the organization, in the, in the leadership, in the, in the governance structure that didn't feel right? Well, absolutely. <clears throat> With some frequency. So uh, folks often ask me, well, what, why do you invest in this company or not that company? And they're sometimes surprised uh, by my answer. I, I, all the obvious things in terms of quality of management and the, and, uh, the uh, profitability of the business and the growth prospects for the industry, all that. But the number one thing we talk about, if you were to sit in our Monday meetings, what we call the moms, the meeting of the minds, where we talk about every, every company, every new deal, every week, we ask about the uh, efficacy of, of the product or the service. If, if, the, if the company isn't providing something that's uh, incredibly valuable to its customer, then um, really all those other things are, they don't matter. It's not, it's not going to be sustainable. Uh, what we love about Dwyer at, at the end of the day is the value that it provides to its franchisee and then they in turn provide to the homeowner is extraordinary. 
Uh, and uh, that means that the profit that they can generate is sustainable. So, so when we find businesses that, and this happens uh, with some frequency in our economy, for a period of time, a company can provide a, a good or a service and, and realize excess profit, if you will, but it's not going to be sustainable, and we don't want to be the folks holding the ball uh, when that, when that uh, comes to pass. In addition to that, uh, when our teams go out and visit the company, uh, they're required to score the company based on uh, what we call ESG plus V, so environmental, social, governance, and values. And obviously, it's um, preliminary. Uh, you spend a day with the company and, and you that's, score. That's, that's besides the, like, do, looking through the finances and all. In addition like, to everything else. In addition else. to everything else. Yep. Okay. Uh, it's preliminary, but then if we're going to move forward, they're going to continue to examine those things. And before we make the investment, we're going to look again and score on an ESG plus V and ask ourselves, is this the kind of company we want to be involved with? And, and that V is, is very important. If, if, if the sense is that the company is um, rounding the corners too much, um, then uh, our, uh, it's not going to be our cup of tea. It's not going to be, our, it's not going to be an investment for us. Do you, um, do you feel like you're giving up on, on potential profit at that point? Or do you have investors who have like, taken you aside and said, <laughs> and said listen, like, Stuart, this is a really good company. They're doing really well. Like, the values thing can take a back seat. Possibly. I, I, I would, my answer would be that I, when I look at Riverside and uh -huh. I look at um, the uh, quality of our investors and I look at the... Um, quality of our lenders, and I look at the uh, management teams and sellers that want to partner with us, <clears throat> and then very importantly, when I look at our own employees, I believe that they want to be a part of Riverside precisely because of our values. Yeah. So maybe it's a self-selected group. Maybe if we had, uh, if we had behaved in other ways, we would have attracted a whole other set of folks. But I, I, I believe that the folks who have associated themselves with Riverside. We're, we're privileged enough to have them be a part of the Riverside family, if you will. Invest in us, lend to us, uh, partner with us, and work for us precisely because of those values. And, and it's just what Dina was saying. If we were to change those values, I think people would um, drift away from us. And I dare say if, if, if somehow uh, some virus spread through Gander and people weren't so kind, uh, folks would drift off and want to live somewhere else. They're probably not living there for the weather. Um, <laughs> not, not, not in Cleveland. That, that's why we live in Cleveland. <laughs> not in Cleveland either. Um, actually, yeah. summers, summers are yeah. amazing here. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> I want, we're going to bring in questions from all of you in just a second, but I, Stuart and Dean, I have a sort of philosophical question for you mm -hmm. as we, as as we wrap up this portion, um, what's capitalism for? I, I would just say we're in a capitalistic business, I guess, because we want to help others be more successful. I mean, that's why we do what we do. So maybe that's not a good answer uh, for this audience, but that's how I think about it. We really love what we do. And what we mm -hmm. do is we change people's lives. We make people's lives more comfortable in their homes. And um, at the end of the day, we do need to be rewarded for that. And so we, we do need to get paid for it, but it starts first with people and taking great care of people. Stuart? Reflecting back 40 years ago to my education as, a, as an uh, economics major at Oberlin College, you know, to, to me, at the heart of capitalism is the allocation of capital. Uh, and societies are enormously benefited when capital is allocated wisely. And they're um, incredibly disadvantaged when capital is allocated uh, poorly. <clears throat> and we can see so many uh, examples of this um, through, throughout history. Uh, and uh, imperfect though it may be, capitalism has proven to be uh, the best way to allocate capital uh, so long as it's uh, done uh, on an even playing field with ample opportunity for all, with proper guardrails, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm a proponent of capitalism. In another uh, City Club uh, uh, lunch, if you wish, someday we can talk about how private equity is, I believe, a force for good, not evil, within a capitalist economy. But to me, that's, that's at the core of capitalism. 
There's definitely a longer conversation there. Yeah, <laughs> um, I could add I want, to that specifically I, with the. I want to invite all of you to probe there mm -hmm. a little yeah. bit, but let's um, let's let's move to the Q and A today. We're enjoying a forum on values in action and why values matter in business, politics, communities, and life more generally. Um, featuring Stuart Cole, who you just heard from, co-CEO of the Riverside Company, the Honorable Percy Farwell, Mayor of the Town of Gander in Newfoundland, and Dina Dwyer Owens, co-chairman of the Dwyer Group. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, as I said, and we do welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our webcast or our Facebook Live video. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can leave it in the comments there, and we'll try to work it in. Holding our microphones today are content coordinator Bliss Davis and Youth Forum Council Chair Tiolu Orsanya. May we have our first question, please? Yes, uh, to Adina and Stuart. I imagine um, immigrant intra entrepreneurs would be an excellent place to invest because they do tend to be, immigrants tend to be very religiously oriented and very family oriented. You want to go first? You go ahead. When I think, and I live in this world of franchising, uh, immigrants are wonderful franchisees. I mean, we have uh, an opportunity to serve a diverse group of franchisees, right? Anybody who's interested in owning their own business and is looking to the systems uh, that we can teach them so they can be successful in operating their businesses is a great candidate for us. And we have amazing diversity at Dwyer Group. I just love, I, we had basic training this week in Waco, Texas, and just looking across the room, there's just amazing diversity. I would think about immigrants um, for our franchisees front line. So one of the greatest needs we have in the businesses that we're in is um, we're lacking people growing up in the trades. So uh, unfortunately, it's harder and harder to find a great technicians um, who can come and take care of your homes. We've got plenty of customers, right? You all need our services, but we've got to keep growing technicians. And so we're venturing out even in doing a women in the trades program. Uh, one of my passions is to help more women understand there's a great opportunity for them to be in the trades. And so we're offering scholarships, just awarded eight scholarships actually for this semester to women of all different backgrounds who love working with their hands and uh, making a difference in the customers' lives. And they're perfect candidates. So some are immigrants, some are not immigrants. You know, it's just uh, we need more people um, as franchisees as well as people on the front lines that are hungry um, to build successful businesses and in the process help other people be successful. Stuart? I just, add, great answer. I just add, um, I think the technology companies have been very uh, uh, outspoken and articulate about how important um, uh, taking advantage of, of immigrants, I don't mean in, in the negative sense, has been and, and how um, much our country has been uh, advantaged by the fact that uh, people from around the world, not so many from Canada, uh, want to uh, come here to uh, uh, build lives, build families, build businesses. Next question. Uh, we have a question from Twitter. Um, it is from Charles Stack, and he says, can you give some specific recommendations for scaling values as you grow from two to 2,000 people? Mm -hmm. Dina Dwyer. Yeah, I go back to the comment um, Stuart Cole made earlier, and that was about the alignment of the people that invest in Riverside's funds, the, uh, the partners <laughs> that they have on their team at Riverside. Um, I think to go from the 1,000 to the 2,000, you've got to make sure that you are intentional about the people you're bringing into your organization. And part of our interview process is we talk about our values. You know, is this a good fit for you as a potential employee or even as a franchisee? Because we're not gonna award you a franchise if we don't believe you're aligned with our values. What do you ask people? Well, we talk about who we are mm -hmm. and do you wanna be a part of this? And I wanna go back to the very first time Riverside approached us. They were desperate. This young man, Lawrence Lachey at the time, wanted Dwyer Group so bad he could see this opportunity for an annuity, right? Um, and Lauren just didn't want to give up on Dwyer, and I was a little afraid of private equity, to be honest with you. As Stuart started off, you know, there's this fear of, are they just money-hungry folks that it's all about the dollar, and our business is all about the relationship? Well, we invited them to Waco. They could see the, the numbers. Um, we were publicly traded at the time, and I said, I'll invite you to Waco, but I want to know who Riverside is. I don't want to talk about the numbers at all. I want to know who are the people of Riverside, and is there a cultural fit between our two companies? And at the end of that day, as you can tell, we're here today for the second time. Um, we felt like they truly were the principal professionals that they said that they were, and they have, they have become that. So it's who you align yourselves with. And again, we have a diverse organization, people from many different backgrounds and, and many different parts of the world. But the one thing we have in common is we are aligned in our values, and that's mm -hmm. how you take it from 1,000 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. 
Stuart, you, you advise companies all the time on scaling, and, and in fact, you're depending on them to scale. Absolutely. <clears throat> that's, how we get, that's how we make money, if you will, is when they grow. Um, and if they could all grow as, as fast as Dwyer, 100% over three years, that, that would work well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love Dina's word intentional. Um, you need to understand uh, the uh, amount of time the management team spends talking about this uh, overused quote, but um, uh, organizations like Fish, they, you know, they rot from the head. Uh, if, if the leadership of the organization isn't committed to those values, it's, it's not going to... It really not does gonna... just bring a, a nice image. <laughs> with a, you know. we, we, we're finished with lunch. Yeah. Uh, uh, How was the tilapia? It was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's not going to hold up. Um, what I, what I, what's, and we, at Riverside, we, we've scaled to 250 at Riverside itself, not to 2,000. So Dina's advice, I think, is most important here. But just watching that process, what I am amazed at is how much of that can be done, um, uh, and again, sort of playing on, on Dina's uh, words, it, it becomes um, self-reinforcing. Uh, if you, it, it, the key is, is, to, is to attract the right people, hire the right people, and they will, in many cases, self-select. Uh, but the way that happens is we have a, a hiring process that involves a surprising number of meetings and interviews. It's a, in many ways a bottoms up or upside down type of hiring process. So um, our more junior people are very involved in it. And, and the net result of that is that um, it's, you don't hire a lot of people that don't fit. And the few you do, um, uh, the, it, the organism rejects them. Uh, because they just, they're not a fit. And in many cases, they, they reject themselves because they're just a fish out of water. Mm -hmm. Sorry with all the fish analogies. <laughs> <laughs> a rotting fish out of water, if you will. Next question, please. Hi, Stuart. I think this question is primarily for you. Uh, it's about the laws. In this country and in many other countries, I can't speak specifically to Canada, the courts really emphasize valuation maximation, uh, yeah. maximization in their decision making. Yeah. With the exception of B corporations and a couple of very special unique scenarios, uh, if you don't maximize the value of my um, investment, I can sue you and win. Yeah. Do we need to have legal changes in this country or is this more uh, a court's need to change the way they think about it over time, yeah. which I don't have the patience for? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm far from, from an expert here, but, but I, I will say I agree with your analysis. If, if any of you have read the work by Peter Georgescu, another person would be wonderful to get on the stage here, who's, who's, he, he's identified this as an, a significant inhibitant because when, when uh, general counsels come in and advise boards on their responsibilities, um, with rare exceptions, there's this tremendous emphasis on the need to, to maximize near-term shareholder value. Uh, but I think this is a case where um, it's that this is changing as we speak. It's evolving. Courts may lag or follow what's happening in society. But I, I also believe that companies are going to increasingly be able to make a compelling case that um, taking into consideration all of the stakeholders, taking into consideration what for most institutions, what what is the what's the most valuable asset of of, of the of the company? It's their brand. It's their image. And um, it, can be, it can be sullied, uh, in today's world, it can be sullied literally overnight. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, um, I believe that is, um, we're living through a, a dynamic period, but it is changing. Where does that come from, the, mm -hmm. this, the ways in which um, Becky identified the courts operating? Yeah. Um, the, that's not a constitutional matter. That's not... It's, it's, it, 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 it's literally precedent uh, handed down by, uh, over time, the courts established a series of laws which instructed boards how to handle mm -hmm. their responsibilities to the shareholders and I, I, I believe reached perhaps the peak of saying your job as a shareholder is to maximize the value of, this, of the stock today most narrowly defined. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah. We have next question. What advice would you give businesses who would like to make this change in their companies? Because it's one thing to start from the get-go that this is who we are, this is what we do. But for businesses who have a different process now, how do you get buy-in when it might mean short-term drop-in sales revenue? Mm. 
<laughs> the leaders have to have it um, inside of them. It's all from the inside out, isn't it? So if the leadership doesn't believe in values and leading a company with values, that's going to be very challenging. Um, I would direct you to, I have a free workbook called Create Your Culture that takes you through six simple steps. Not easy, but simple steps on how to really create your culture. So whether you're starting from scratch and really just identifying your core values as an organization, and it does begin with the leadership <clears throat> being willing to own those values and lead by example and be held accountable when they violate their own values. Um, but you could go there and, and try that if it's the organization that you know, you're in today. That would be one tool you could go to. DinoDwyerOwens.com is a website, by the way. And it's a free work because I want to help as many people as possible create these, these cultures of values-based leadership. So I, I sense that part of that question is about what do you do when you're not the leader? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you either help the leader come <laughs> along or you leave. <laughs> and you find the right organization that fits who you are and the values that you believe in. And so many young people are in the room today. And I would encourage the young people um, to be clear about your values. You could go to this workbook and create your own culture, right? Who, who are you and what's most important to you in your life today? And when you go to, to work for a company, find a company that's aligned with your values. But you need to be clear about what your values are. Otherwise, you might get sucked into an organization that, you know, maybe they've got a, a big brand, but maybe they are not the most ethical company, and it's very easy to get caught up in, this is how we do it here, it's okay. Stuart, as an as a equity and, and sort of stakeholder in companies, have you ever, and you no doubt sit on many company boards and so forth, have you often gotten, have there been moments where you've gotten involved where the culture's not 100% there, but they're going through a transition and you recognize that there's influence you can have to, make, to help them make that cultural change? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to start by agreeing what Dina said at, at the very outset, which is um, I'm imperfect, <laughs> Riverside's imperfect, and just about every company we've met, with the exception of Dwyer, is imperfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's just the nature of business. It's, it's big, it's complicated, it's noisy, it changes quickly, it's, and sometimes you look back and, and even say to yourself, what was I thinking? Um, we, we don't get it right every time. Um, but uh, we look for companies um, that have the desire to get it right, have proven the ability to get it right much more often than not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to the extent we can try to help them have, uh, have these um, processes, and in many cases things we've learned from Dwyer, of how do you how do you uh, how do you ex uh, accelerate it or encourage it or nurture it perhaps is 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 the better word. Uh, going back to the, to the prior question, um, if you're trying to impose it on on on, a, on an organization that doesn't want it, it it's not going to be successful. Uh, I don't even think the leader can do that alone. It uh, private equity, my industry used to be referred to as buyouts, but I think there's a case of buy-ins. You, you need to have tremendous buy-in. Uh, people have to want to do it. They have to recognize that it's, uh, it's going to make, it's going to improve the quality of their life. I'd like to add to that because you're right, Stuart. When we, uh, you know, our founder passed away in 94 and then we came up with these operationalized values, we didn't just say to the employees, and there were about 125 employees at that time, okay, starting today, here are the new values <laughs> we're going to lead by. Instead, we gamified the values and we basically said, employees, we need your help because we knew we needed their buy-in or they would never work. Plus, we had not demonstrated our commitment as a leadership team yet to live by those values. So we handed them a laminated card and we said for 90 days we want your feedback and, the, and that came in the form of a simple beep. We're from Waco again, kind of silly. <laughs> but they studied those values and anytime they caught a management team member violating one of the values over that 90 day period, they would verbally beep us. <laughs> You guys remember the Roadrunner? <laughs> Sounded yeah. like he was racing through yeah. our buildings for the 90 days because we were not very good at those new values. But the great news is, is the employees were committed to helping us. At the end of the 90 days, we brought them back together and they said <clears throat> they loved it. They thought it was a great solution. They added a value that actually is one of the hardest ones we have today. But we got their buy-in because we asked them to help us be good at it. What was that value? <laughs> the, what they added was, okay, <laughs> listen carefully. They added never saying anything about anyone that you would not say to him or her. They said there's so much drama created in organizations because people don't have the courage to get face to face with the person that can do something about it. Yeah. And so I would say, for me, that's probably the hardest one. Back to the golden rule. Next question. 
It struck me that as you were talking about all the charitable missions that you <clears throat> seem to all have as for-profit entities, when we just went through tax reform, the concept of not-for-profits was really drawn into question. And I just was wondering if you had personal opinions upon the blurring distinction of those that exist for charitable missions and those uh, entities that are really enveloping charitable missions also as a for-profit. What's the distinction between not-for-profit and for-profit to some degree? She sits on my board here. We're a nonprofit, <laughs> just <laughs> FYI, just full disclosure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, tough question uh, that Christian asked, um, because I, precisely because I think lines are blurring. Uh, and and, and I, I just want to point out a, a lot of the blur is good blur, I think, because uh, we're what, and I, and I work with a, a number of nonprofits, and, and um, my, my sense is that uh, over the last years, we've seen a dramatic um, uh, improvement in the performance of nonprofits. I think that um, today, nonprofits uh, have, uh, in some cases, some of the best uh, CEOs in Cleveland are running nonprofit organizations. Dan is doing a great job right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's partially because I think people have realized these jobs are, are extremely fulfilling and rewarding. They may not be quite as rewarding financially, but they bring uh, so many other rewards. It's partially because I think nonprofit organizations are willing now to compensate in ways that make them more competitive to attract and retain the best uh, talent as well. And it's partially because uh, just as a world, as a society, as an economy, <clears throat> our businesses are getting better and better. Um, we're being trained better, uh, the uh, technology enables more. So once upon a time, maybe it had to be this you know, very large, uh, successful corporation to take advantage of these, this training and this, uh, and this technology. But today, startups can literally just, uh, just embrace it and, and, uh, and emerge. So I think, I think we're seeing a, a wonderful uh, period for nonprofits. There may be some consolidation going on because uh, maybe the world doesn't need as many, but the survivors are, are really being uh, emerging as great organizations. Simultaneously, maybe there's uh, this recognition among for-profits that they can, for-profits can address some of society's uh, crying needs, most, most important needs, and, and this capitalism and the allocation of capital can do it successfully. Um, but it does create this overlap, this blur. Uh, I, I'm not smart enough to figure out how this is going to evolve or where it's going to end. But it, maybe, that's, maybe that's part of what, what we're witnessing. I, I, I would just say all of us who are, who are civically active should be um, picking uh, nonprofit organizations that, uh, that uh, appeal to you, that it's a cause that's important to you. And, and we should be challenging these organizations to, to, to do more, to get better, uh, to be better resourced when necessary to consolidate for greater effectiveness. Um, that, I think that's our the community's responsibility. And then to give them the resources they need to succeed. I will do a very short commercial for Velosana, which I think is such a, you, you referenced at the outset, Dan, and thank you for that, which I think is such a, a great example of that. Um, uh, you know, here we are uh, four years later, and uh, we've raised $12.5 million for research to find cures for cancer. Research is being done right here in, in our uh, community by, by uh, doctors and scientists at the Cleveland Clinic and, and, and beyond who are our neighbors, uh, doing cutting edge uh, research. And that money all came because folks in, in, in Cleveland gathered together and uh, the clinic was, a, the Cleveland Clinic was a, a fantastic uh, sponsoring organization and Cleveland Indians got on board uh, and brought their big bats to it. And Paul Dolan has been an amazing co-chair. We said together we can create something out of uh, literally out of whole cloth, out of nothing. And um, uh, I'm proud of what we've created already, but we've just begun. And uh, this year we're going to have uh, uh, perhaps as many as 2,500 riders raising as much as five million dollars wow. for this cause. Uh, and we wow. can just keep growing from here. So, so that's that's nonprofit. Uh, it's but it's it's modern. It's active. It's it's uh, uh, very uh, a real sense of of efficient effectiveness and urgency. Thank you. Another question? I'd like to turn to Mayor Farwell. And first of all, thank you and your community for your heroic endeavors during a very dark time. 
and ask if you can articulate any lasting cultural shift in your community since then. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly been a lasting, the legacy of it is, I mean, you know, we're, we talk about the corporate world and, and how, you know, values, values based uh, companies, hopefully there's some benefit settles to the bottom line. And I think there's some evidence of that. In a community, that's, you know, there, there are certainly, we, you know, our community didn't respond with any expectation of, of reward, but has been rewarded greatly, primarily through, through the satisfaction and fulfillment of actually having been able to enact a value that is lying within all of us. Uh, but there are, there are other more uh, tangible and economic benefits that accrue from, from that sort of thing as well. I mean... Uh, uh, there's, there, you know, the good, goodwill is not only a uh, an asset that appears on the balance sheet of a corporation, <laughs> and goodwill towards a community can can manifest itself in in potentially investment uh, attraction, certainly tourism attractions, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, you know, the the lasting benefit to our community and others, hopefully, of the fact that you know a big deal has been made of this, and we we didn't ask for it, mm -hmm. but uh, you know we appreciate it. And there is a Broadway musical that is very, high, <laughs> and there is going to be a Hollywood movie. Really? Uh, yes. Shot there's, there's, in, there's already they'll shoot it in Gander. They well, they may shoot. They're they're going to try to shoot some. I don't know. You know, there's I don't know if the technical capacity is there for a lot of what they want to do. This is not mm -hmm. a small budget film. They're going to be. Right. There's going to be a Hollywood movie. Um, so, but to the extent a that brief that, window to capitalize on the sort of like come from away tourism, you know, give people the experience, get off the plane. Yeah. Stay with the local. Get a hug. <laughs> get, a, get a hug. That's, 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 that's what we've kind of struggled with is, you know, how, how do people come looking, you know, having been inspired to come based on that? What do we do? Do we say, well, you're new in town. Give them a hug and ask them to come home for a shower? Because, you know, <laughs> because that's kind of what was going on. Uh, but the, uh, so, you know, the, to the extent that people, you know, anywhere are being inspired by the telling of this story and are inclined to uh, do acts of kindness based on it and probably you know dredges up some things within themselves that's a huge benefit going forward to not just our community but but others and there's evidence of there's evidence of it in our community we've also in the last few years now between the town and some of the local churches and local organizations uh, taken upon ourselves to sponsor five Syrian refugee families that have moved to our town and to an adjacent town. Mm -hmm. And they are integrating into our community. The guy, there's a guy my wife uh, picked up a slab of pizza from the other day. She said, I couldn't understand anything he said. And I said, no, he's, he's learning the language, but he makes good pizza. <laughs> and, and he feels really good about being able to contribute and get, and, and, and these people have young children. I'm, I'm a member of the uh, mm -hmm. Masonic Lodge in, in Gander, Past Master, and, uh, and our lodge holds a, an annual uh, Christmas party for the children, the young children of, of members. And that's been opened up uh, this year to include the children of these Syrian families. And the folks that were, I don't have young children anymore and I wasn't there at that party, but the, the, the folks I spoke to that were there said it, would, it did the heart good to see the excitement on those Syrian children mm -hmm. who completely surrounded Santa Claus when he showed up mm -hmm. and couldn't believe and that they were actually getting their own little personal gift mm -hmm. from Santa at wow. this party. It was, it was, you know, meant the world to everybody that had, you know, in the, in the lives that the sort of we sort of jointly fund the, the little party for the kids, right? So the, to the extent that those things are happening, one of the, uh, one of the passengers we had uh, on 9-11 has had a, a small uh, marketing company in, I want to say Texas. Um, anyway, he's subsequent, he was very inspired and moved by the whole, you know, the whole experience. It went back to his company and every September 11th since then, uh, has broken his staff up into p uh, teams of two, given each of them, each team, a hundred dollars, and said, "Go do three acts of kindness for somebody on September 11th," oh, wow. mm. and that's that's gaining some momentum and so on too, right? So, yeah. so to the extent that those things are uh, are happening, you know, around the way. And this guy, by the way, has written a written a book that's available. Uh, I got it. Uh, channel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, which, yeah, someone someone will give that to someone. Channel of Peace, no. Thank you and there's been much. another book written about, uh, it's called The Day the World Came to Town by a journalist who happened to get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's and the mayor's things, wife right there, by these the way. Things <laughs> um, mayor, we've got to wrap it yeah. up, but uh, Mayor Percy Farwell is uh, from Gander, Newfoundland, Stuart Cole of Riverside Company, and Dina Dwyer Owens of the Dwyer Group have been our guests and our panelists today where we've been enjoying a forum on why values matter in business, politics, communities, and life. 
Today's forum is the Herbert Nettie Borstein Endowed Forum, made possible by a generous gift from Mr. and Mrs. Borstein. We appreciate their continued support of City Club. Our community partner for today's forum is uh, BVU, also known as Business Volunteers Unlimited. Thank you very much for your support in promoting our forum today. Also, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Flash Starts, Global Prairie, and the Riverside Company. In addition, today's forum featured the young, the young Entrepreneur Market, comprised of students from Horizon Science Academy, Hershey Montessori School, Magnificat High School, Shaker Heights High School, and Hudson High School. They're all out in the lobby and uh, eager to sell you things and talk to you about their wares. Uh, student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation. We thank all of the students for joining us today. That does bring us to the end of our program. I want to remind you that you can pick up a copy of Dean Dwyer Owen's book, Values, Inc., How Incorporating Values into Business and Life Can Change the World and Change Your World as well. Dina, thank you for providing those copies of the book. They're available outside. Um, uh, complimentary to all of you. And uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Our forum is adjourned. Thank you. That was fun. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.